the end of the town and be back in time for tea? King John put up a notice, lost or stolen astride, Giants, Giants, Morrison's mother thinks we have been mislaid. Lassie wandering vaguely, quite of her own accord, she tried to get down to the end of the town, forty shillings reward. James, James, Morrison, Morrison, commonly known as Jim, told his other relations not to go blinding them. James, James said to his mother, Mother, he said, said he, you must never go down to the end of the town without consulting me. James, James, Morrison's mother, hasn't been heard since. King John said he was sorry. So did the Queen and Prince. King John, somebody told me, said to a man he knew, if people go down to the end of the town, well, what can anyone do? J, J, um, um, W, G, U, P. To wait the office, um, though he was always right. J, J, said to us, um, um, he said, said he. You must never go down to the end of the town if you don't go down with me. Well, this is not a political evening, and certainly we don't want to get embroiled in the uh, squabbling going on in the Republican Party these days. But I just want to point out that the hero of the poem that follows is one of the leading contenders in the Republican race today. Uh, in the 1930s, as part probably of the pump priming uh, device in the city of New York, they, with the help of private capital, reared up a mighty and beautiful complex of buildings in the center of Manhattan Island. And in the main building, which was beautiful and still is, still there, they uh, commissioned Diego Rivera to play, paint the mural. He did. But in painting the figures into the mural, he put in the figures that he thought were important for the 20th century among whom he included Lenin and Trotsky, Stalin too, I think. Well, it created a big fuss. The mural never was shown. I think that it's reposing somewhere in a museum in Mexico at this point. But uh, E.B. White celebrated that event, the storm, the crisis. Uh, well, let me tell you, E.B. White, I suppose you know, it was an editor of The New Yorker. A famous poet and author of children's books and essays, adult essays. This is a poem that he wrote to celebrate the occasion. It's called, I Paint What I See, by E.B. White. What do you paint when you paint a wall, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson. Do you paint just anything there at all? Will there be any doves, or a tree in fall, or a hunting scene like an English hall? I paint what I see, said Rivera. <laughs> what are the colors you use when you paint, said John Lee's grandson, Nelson? Do you use any red in the beard of a saint? If you do, is it terribly red or faint? <laughs> <laughs> do you use any blue? Is it Prussian? I paint what I paint, said Rivera. <laughs> Whose is that head that I see on my wall, said John Lee's grandson, Nelson? Is it anyone's head whom we know at all, <laughs> or Rensselaer, or Saltonstall? <laughs> is it Franklin D? Is it Morgan Hall? Or is it the head of a Russian? <laughs> I paint what I think, said Rivera. I paint what I paint, I paint what I see, I paint what I think, said Rivera. And the thing that is dearest to life in me to me in life in a bourgeois hall is integrity. However, 
Oh, I'll take out a couple of people drinking and put in a picture of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I could even give you McCormick's Reaper and still not make my art much cheaper. <laughs> but the head of Lenin has got to stay, or my friends will give me the bird today. The bird, the bird, forever. It's not good taste. And a man like me, said John D's grandson Nelson, to question an artist's integrity or mention a practical thing like a fee. But I know what I like to a large degree, though art I hate to hamper. For 21,000 conservative bucks, you painted a radical, I say shucks. I never could rent the offices, the capitalistic offices, for this, as you know, is a public hall and people want doves or a tree in the fall. And though your art I dislike to hamper, I owe a little to God and Ramper. <laughs> and after all, it's my wall. <laughs> we we'll see if it is, said her there. <laughs> Ago, the center players of the Jewish Community Center in Portland put on a play for voices called Under Milkwood by the late Welsh poet Dylan Thomas. They played it in the Civic Theater and in Portland State College all over. Tonight we're going to do just one excerpt from this play for voices and one of the local natives will join us. Harry <laughs> Goldberg. <laughs> Under Milkwood describes a day in the life of a small seacoast town in Wales. It begins with the sleep and dreams of the pre-dawn goes through the morning and afternoon and closes at sunset. In this excerpt, blind Captain Cat is seated at the window of his room in mid-morning, listening to the shouts of the people as they go down the street below him, drowsing and dreaming and drowsing. Captain Cat at his window, thrown wide to the sun and the clipped seas he sailed long ago when his eyes were blue and bright, slumbers and voyages. Earing and roaming, I love your rosy probate tattooed on his belly. He brawls with broken bottles and the fog and babble of the dark dock bars, rolls with a herd of short and good time crows in every naughty port, and twines and souses with the drowned and blousy breasted dead. He weeps as he sleeps and sails. One voice of all he remembers most dearly as his dream buckets down. Lazy early Rosie with the flaxen patch, whom he shared with Tom Fred the Duncanman and many another seaman, clearly and near to him, speaks from the bedroom of her dust. In that gulf and haven, fleets by the dozens have anchored for the little heaven of the night. But she speaks to Captain Napping Cat alone. Mrs. Prober. From Duck Lane, Jack. Clock twice and ask for Rosie. Is the one love of the sea life that was sardine with women. What seas did you see, Tom Cat, Tom Cat? In your sailoring days, long, long ago. What sea these were on the wavery green when you were my master? I'll tell you the truth, seas barking like seals, blue seas and green seas covered with eels, and mermen and whales. What sea did you sail, old whaler, when on the blubbery wave between Frisco and Wales, you were my bosun? As true as I'm here, dear you, Tomcat's tired you, landlubber rosy, you cozy love, my easy as easy. My true sweetheart. Seas green as a bean, 
sees gliding with swans in the seal barking moon. What sees her rocking, my little deck hand, my favorite husband in your sea boots and hunger, my duck, my whaler, my honey, my daddy, my pretty sugar sailor with my name on your belly. When you were a boy, long, long ago, I'll tell you no lies. The only sea I saw was the seesaw sea, with you riding on it. Lie down. Lie easy. Let me shipwreck in your thoughts. Not twice, Jack, at the door of my grave. That's for Rosie. Rosie Probert. Remember her? She is forgetting the earth which filled her mouth is vanishing from her. Remember me. I have forgotten you. I am going into the darkness of the darkness forever. I have forgotten that I was ever born. Look says the child to the mother as they pass by the window of Spooner House. Captain Cat is crying. Captain Cat is crying. Come back. Come back. Up the silences and echoes of the passages of the eternal night. Edward would use women honorably. Bah, would he were wasted, marrow, bone and all. From his line, no hopeful branch may spring to cross me from the golden time I look for. And yet, between my soul's desire and me is Clarence Henry and his young son, Edward, and all the unlooked-for issue of their bodies to take their rooms there I can place myself. Well, say there is no kingdom then for Richard. <coughs> what other pleasure can the world afford? I'll make my heaven in a lady's lap and deck my body with gay ornaments and which Sweet lady, with my words and love. Thou oh, miserable thought, and more unlikely than to achieve twenty golden crowns, while love forswore me in my mother's womb. And that I should not deal in her mystery, she did corrupt frail nature with some pride, to shrink my arm off like a withered shrub, to place an envious mountain on my back where sits deformity to mock me. To disproportion me in every part, like to a chaos or an unlit bear whelp that bears no impression but the damn. Am 
I than a man to be beloved? Thou miserable fault, too hard was such a thought. Since this earth affords no joy to me, but to command, check, and all bear such as are of a better nature than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon a crown, and to account this world we live but hell, until this misshaped trunk that bears this head be round and paler in a glorious crown. And from this torment I shall free myself, or I hew my way out like a bloody axe. I can smile and murder while I smile, and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and cry content to what sorely grieves me, and pray my face to all occasions. Can I do this and not get a crown? Were it off, I'll pluck it down. We are concerned with the poet as critic, the poet as prophet. The poet concerned with man's condition. The first poem of this group by William Meredith, who is a professor of English in Connecticut, was written a contemporary living was written in, during the Second World War, I believe on a Pacific Atoll. Do not embrace your mind's new Negro friend, uh, William Meredith. Do not embrace your mind's new Negro friend. All that the black hole you would mention. There must be years of atonement first, and even then, you may still believe be the blundering raconteur of the wrong story, and they may still be free. If you are with them, if even mine is friends, there will be plenty to do. Give the liars a lesson who have heard no rumors of truth for a long time. But have for any of here on good authority, whether it concerns Chinese women or the art. Soul kissing, some of whose best friends are brothers and who are never now among us. What kind of credit do they expect for that? Ask them. Or better, ask their protested brothers. The grateful tenants who can't get their strips with them. And the injured, who have been convinced by the repeated name that they are Jews or Negroes or extremely dark things. They must be courted with a loving touch and as quickly as with yourself, a single evil. If you can speak this poem, you will have friends more than a trace of our human blood. In the meantime, engage in the often friendless struggle, a long war, a pygmy war in ways, but iron by iron, you must go far. Clark in Portland, there 
lives a poet who in the past two years has been getting mountains of national recognition, William Stafford. Last year it was the National Book Award for Poetry. This year he just received the Shelley Award. The following poem is called Our City is Guarded by Automatic Rockets. William Stafford. Breaking every law except the one for gold, rolling its porpoise way, the rocket staggers on its course. Its feelers lock a stranglehold ahead, and rocking, finders whispering, target, target, back and forth, relocating all its meaning in the dark. It freezes on the final stage. I know that lift can pour the flick out of the sky, and then the power. Power is not enough. Thou touching, thou touching, till the shore, a lake, an undecided river, and the lake again, saddling the divide. A world that won't be wise and let alone, but instead is found the outside by little channels linked by chance, not stern. And then when once we're sure we hear a guide, it fades away toward the opposite end of the road from home. The world goes wrong in order to have revenge. Our lives are an amnesty given us. There is a place behind our hills so real it makes me turn my head no matter. There in the last thicket lies the cornered cat, saved by its claws, now ready to spend all there is left of the wilderness embracing its blood. And that is the way that I will spit light at the end of any trail where I smell any hunter. Because I think our story should not end or go on in the dark with nobody listening. have endlessly moved from Malay's love poetry. Very few of them have her poems of social protest because she was much concerned at the time the loyalist Spain, Nazi Germany, things that were going on about her. This is one of her expressions. Conscientious objector at the same Vincent Malay. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do for death. I hear him leading his horse out of the stall. I hear the clatter on the barn floor. He is in haste. He has business in Cuba, business in the Balkans, many calls to make this morning. But I will not hold the bridle while he cinches the girth. Though he flick my shoulders with his whip, I will not tell him which way the fox ran. With his hook on my breast, I will not tell him where the black boy hides in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all that I shall do to death. I am not on his tail. I will not tell him the whereabouts of my friends, nor of my enemies either. Though he promised me much, I will not map him the route to any man's door. Am I a spy in the land of the living that I should deliver men to death? Brother, the password and the plans of our city are safe with me, never through me. Another poet, in verse, 
Again, social protest rarely appears in anthology. Is this same Archibald McLeish, whose ivory tower definition of a poem apparently was an early contradiction to how he felt later on in life, because he too was about Franco Spain, Nazi Germany, and so on. Many and so on. This is his speech to a crowd by Archibald McLeish. Tell me, my patient friends, awaiters of messages, from what other shore, from what stranger, whence was the word to come? Who was to lessen you? Listeners under a child's crib in a manger, listener once by the oracles, now by the transoms, whom are you waiting for? Who do you think will explain? Listeners thousands of years, and still no answer. Writers at night to Miss Lonely Heart, awkward sellers. Open your eyes. There is only earth in the man. There is only you. There is no one else on the telephone. No one else is on the air to whisper. No one else but you will push the bell. No one knows if you don't. Neither ships nor land fields decode the dark between. You have your eyes, and what your eyes see is. The earth you see is really the earth you are seeing. The sun is truly excellent, truly warm. Women are beautiful as their, you have seen them. Their breath believe it. Like cooing of doves in a portico, they bear at their breast tenderness softly. Look at them. Look at yourselves. You are strong. You are well formed. Look at the world, the world you never took. It is really true you may live in the world heedlessly. Why do you wait to read it in a book then? Write it yourselves. Write to yourselves if you need to. Tell yourselves there is sun and the sun will rise. Tell yourself the earth has food to feed you. Let the dead man say that men must die. Who better than you can know what death is? How can a bone or a broken body surmise it? Let the dead shriek with their whispering breath. Laugh at them. Say the murdered God may wake. But we who work have end of work together. Tell yourselves the earth is yours to take. Waiting for messages out of the dark, you were poor. The world was always yours. You, you would, would not, not take, take it. it. When I was very young, I recollect going out into the street at night with my mother and father and seeing many agitated people back and forth. And when I asked my mother what had happened, she said, Sacco and Manzetti were executed. During the seven years of their imprisonment and their subsequent execution, many playwrights and poets have exposed this frame-up, have vindicated them. But it is for Bartolomeo Vanzetti's own words in his last speech to the court to show you the kind of courage and soul these two men had. We would therefore like to dedicate this poem well, that's what it is really, a prose poem. To Morton Sobel, who has been for 14 years a political prisoner. Bartolomeo Vanzetti's last speech to the court. I have talked a great deal of myself. But I even forgot to name Sacco. Sacco, too, is a worker. From his boyhood, a skilled worker, lover of work, with a good job and pay, 
bank account, good and lovely wife, two beautiful children, and a neat little home at the verge of a wood near a brook. Sacco is a heart, a faith, a character, a man. A man lover of nature and mankind. A man who gave all, who sacrificed all to the cause of liberty and to his love for mankind. Money, rest, mundane ambition, his own wife, his children, himself, and his own life. Sacco has never dreamt to steal, never to assassinate. He and I have never brought a morsel of bread to our mouths from our childhood to today, which has not been gained by the sweat of our brows. Never. Oh, yes. I may be more witful, as some have put it. I am a better babbler than he is. But many, many times, in hearing his heartful voice ringing of faith sublime, in considering the supreme sacrifice, remembering his heroism, I felt small at the presence of his greatness and found myself compelled to fight back from my eyes the tears and quench my heart, troubling to my throat, to not weep before him. This man called thief and assassin and doom. But Sacco's name will live in the hearts of the people and in their gratitude when Katzman's bones and yours will be dispersed by time. When your name, his name, your laws, institutions, and your false god are but a dim remembering of a cursed past in which man was woe to the man. If it had not been for these things, I might have lived out my life talking at street corners to scorning men. I might have died unmarked, unknown, a failure. Now we are not a failure. This is our career and our triumph. Never in all our full life could we hope to do such work for tolerance, for justice, for man's understanding of man as now we do, by accident. Our words, our lives, our pains, nothing. The taking of our lives, lives of a good shoemaker and a poor fish peddler, all, that last moment belongs to us. That agony is our triumph. that's worse than a secret drinker is a secret poet. We were probably married close to a year, I think, before she deigned to read me some of her poems. It was a long time ago. The following poem is uh, by Rose Leopold. Solitude, Madison to Beach. The ocean lines roll undisturbed fall straight away to shore. All grasses in the dream, winds of spring, and more, more sand, more sea. And far beyond this space outstretched, mountain fingers touching ends of ends. Where do we go from here? Nowhere. Seek solace in the sand. Seek solace in the sky, which for the moment lie empty of eternal returning the sun. Rest, 
merge the beautiful, merge with and to thunder crash each one of us, each one and I, under scan silently the straight curve, the way the grasses and the dunes outstretch your fingers in these airy rooms. Our finite, seek an infinite, which for the moment, solid flame. For the last number, this series, start by saying, in Xanadu did Kubra Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, and its name was San Francisco. And in the city of San Francisco is a famous bookstore called the City Lights Bookstore. And the City Lights Bookstore is owned by a poet. Poet is Lauren Sperlinghetti. This is his I Am Waiting by Lauren Sperlinghetti. I am waiting for my case to come up, and I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder, and I am waiting for someone to really discover America and wail. And I am waiting for the discovery of a new symbolic western frontier. And I am waiting for the American eagle to really spread its wings and straighten up and fly right. And I am waiting for the age of anxiety to drop dead. And I am waiting for the war to be fought which will make the world safe for anarchy. And I am waiting for the final withering away of all governments. And I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I'm waiting for the second coming. And I'm waiting for a religious revival to sweep through the state of Arizona. And I am waiting for the grapes of wrath to be stored. And I am waiting for them to prove that God is really American. And I am seriously awaiting for Billy Graham and Elvis Presley to exchange roles seriously. And I am waiting to see God on television, piped onto church altars, if only they can find the right channel to tune in on. But no, I can't. But tonight, get the amber up shit. I've been in the shower, though, even off in the snow here, good. Oh, you. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I am waiting to get some intimations of immortality by recollecting my early childhood. And I am waiting for the green mornings to come again. Youth's dumb green fields come back again. And I am waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shake my typewriter. And I am waiting to write the great indelible poem. And I am waiting for that last long careless rapture. And I am perpetually waiting for the fleeting lovers on the Grecian urn to catch each other up at last and embrace. And I am waiting perpetually and forever a renaissance of wonder.
you will read my the last one. You got a whole bunch of shelf. Although this is a personal poem that I wrote, I believe it has application for all people who have been married for a number of years. To my husband. Often, when I ease myself on the both of you, and bend to smooth your tired face, I think, where have the years all gone? What have they done with us, and we with them? Then close you in my love's embrace. Between my kiss upon your kiss, the question softly at a break. Why your puissance diminished to routine ways? Why your sense of fumbles in coins? Did you default your gifted dream because I encircle your day and circle you closer to me by this? Still unshriven, that golden world is lined across your eyes. The blue of all desires plummets in their stellar space, wingless still, half formed, hemmed in by all the old I love you and life commercial compromise. I will do them while we still embrace the lovely heart, multitude and space. Let my tears beat the air without a trace. stand shimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return upon the high strand. Begin and cease, and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the poles of a bright girdle furrow. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Our love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so varied, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor healthful faith. And we are here as on a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies flash by night. For the last 
last poem, I would like to preface it by saying that in this crazy world where man's inductive, deductive, constructive, and seductive powers are used for destructive ends, this kind of a feeling is good to come across. The kind of thing that Whitman spoke of, the form of life, that Dylan Thomas wrote of, a life force. This is a poem by John Hall Wheelock, contemporary, I believe another professor of English. In fact, he's just written, quite an old man, he's just written a book of poetic criticism, his definition of what poetry is. This is his poem, The Mass, by John Hall Wheelock. What is this secret joy that in all things alive, which time soon shall destroy, will flourish still and thrive? Brute rumor in the blood, dim prescience in the heart, of some transcendent good in which they have a part. Some sense in each of all, bounding its finite will, splendor perpetual, steadfast, abiding still. Beyond these accidents of change, of death and birth, the changeless excellence that gives all change its worth. From some deep wisdom springs the joy all beings share. The tragedy of things is but a mask it wears. The joy that in the dark kindles a million stars will hood the ancient spark in endless woes and war. On earth, where joys abound, only sheer joy to be. The heel upon the ground goes down in ecstasy. Or move to a brisk measure, in step an arch will rise, and dance rhythm whose pleasure music multiplies. Such bounty we inherit, such dear delight is here, the heart shall hardly bear it to know a thing so dear. In springtime, when the swallow veers in her windy flight, when in green dell and hollow the little leaves hang light, by meadowland or water, in ocean, earth, and air, to swift escape or slaughter, one joy moves everywhere. For joy the elm leaf tips sway green against the sky, the fire between joy and lips is kindled in fierce joy. For joy, joy for joy, joy, for joy, joy. The, the tragic, tragic stage is set, in tragic masks for joy, slayer and slain are met. Some joy deep and indwelling, in all these forms that play, a joy beyond all telling, burns life, burns death away. You'd have to stand up, though. 
Yeah, yeah. well, I wish. Let me figure it out for myself. I have to stand up on this level. That's very good. Let me try this one. First, I go down my come stop. <sighs> just a minute. Not good. Why don't you just reverse what you did and go down, stand there, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I sit on the second me? stair? Oh, that's what was wrong, yeah. Go down to the... No, that was it. That was it. One step. Let me do it. Let me do it myself. Now, Fini and... No. No. Wait, 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 wait. That was it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, bravo. See, a lot of bridges at the applause. You better applaud because of the now, bridges. Do you want uh, Wednesday to then wait till you're through with the group? Or no, you? each poem. Each poem. Now yeah, now. that gives us a chance to pick up a book, take it down, and for them to have a respite, an in-between pause between listening to us. Besides, it works up enthusiasm among them. <laughs> Stop from that sounds good. <laughs> Okay, so that's this. this Better get your flag while well organized. Well, I'm I'm leaving it to you guys. Okay, okay, now this goes down and pick up this book. We're uh, oh, there's time for that. A little more. It usually lasts just about. Uh, really. Uh, this is not a political evening, and least of all would we like to and would we care to inject ourselves into the. Uh, political battles that are going on within the ranks of the Republican Party today. But you will note that the hero of the following poem is one of the leading contenders in the Republican ranks. In the 1930s, New York, as part of its effort to pull itself out of the Depression doldrums, had, with private capital, built for itself a tremendous complex of buildings in midtown Manhattan. Diego Rivera was commissioned to do a mural in the main building, main lobby, which he did. But lo and behold, it excited paper loads of comment and uh, controversy because it seems that Diego Rivera, in painting the people who were notable in the 20th century into the mural, painted the faces of Stalin, Trotsky, and Lenin. Eventually, the uh, mural never was shown, and I think now it's reposing quietly in some museum in Mexico City. E.B. White, the editor of The New Yorker, and as well as children's books and humorous poetry, celebrated the event with the following parody, with the following satire, I should say. I paint what I see by E.B. White. What do you paint when you paint a wall, said John Lee's grandson, Nelson? Do you paint just anything there at all? Will there be any doves or a tree in fall? Or a hunting scene like an English hall? I paint what I see, said Rivera. What are the colors you use when you paint, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson? Do you use any red in the beard of a saint? If you do, is it terribly red or faint? Do you use any blue? Is it Prussian? I paint what I paint, said Rivera. Whose is that head that I see on my wall, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson? Is it anyone's head whom we know at all? A Rensselaer or a Salfrey Saul? Is it Franklin D? Is it Morton Hall? Or is it the head of a Russian? I paint what I think, said Rivera. I paint what I think, I paint what I see, I paint what I think, said Rivera. And the thing that is dearest to life in me in a bourgeois hall is integrity. Oh, however, I'll take out a couple of people drinking and put in a picture of Abraham Lincoln. I could even give you McCormick's Reaper and still not make my art much cheaper. 
But the head of Lenin has got to stay, or my friends will give me the bird today. The bird, the bird forever. It's not good taste in a man like me, said John Lee's grandson Nelson, to, uh, to question an artist's integrity or mention a practical thing like a fee. But I know what I like to a large degree, though art I hate to hamper. For 21,000 conservative bucks, you painted a radical. I say shucks. I never could rent the offices, the capitalistic offices. For this, as you know, is a public hall, and people want doves or a tree in fall. And though your art I dislike to hamper, I owe a little to God and Grandpa. And after all, it's my wall. We'll see if it is, said your bear. Uh, now, Harry, for the past two to three years, the Center Players, Portland Jewish Community Center, have been performing in the Civic Theater in Portland State College, various places throughout the city, a very beautiful play for voices by the late Welsh poet Dylan Thomas. Tonight we are going to do one small excerpt from that lovely play, and we have one of the natives to join us. Harry Goheen. That's your clack. I don't know what is this. Well, honey, wait until we sit. Oh, wait until we sit. We're, Harry, we're going to sleep immediately. Okay. I decided. Under No Wood is the story of a day in the life of a small Welsh town, of a small sea town in Wales. It begins in the dreams of pre dawn oh, wait, the lights are not right. Oh, yeah, why do you the lights here? These two lights, the center and mine, are out. Bernie's is on as he says this, and as he walks back and narrates yeah, watch what we do, Carter. You have to watch this. Because there are a few things happening. First, Harry comes on. Then, as I start talking, you can start dimming it. And this one see, as I say, Under Milkwood is a story of a day in the life of a small sea town in Wales. It starts in the dreams and sleep of pre-dawn takes us through the waking town, through the day, and ends at sunset. In this excerpt, do you hear it, Carter? You're supposed to be lowering it now, as I talk. Huh? Oh, For all of them. No, very, oh. wait a second. The center light and my light goes out. Just wait, let me stop. stop. Because he is doing the narrating. He therefore has to have his light on. When he finishes the narrating and I speak up, you'll hear me later on. Captain Cat, at his window thrown wide to the sun and the clipped slips, ships he sailed long ago and his eyes were blue and bright, slumbered in voyages. Earring and rolling, I love you, rosy trumpet tattooed on his belly. He brawls with broken bottles in the fog and babble of dark, dark bars. Rolls with a herd of shore from good time cows in every naughty port, and twines and souses with the drowned and blousy breasted dead. He weeps as he sleeps and sails. One voice of all he remembers most dearly is his green bucket sound. Lazy, early rosy with a flaxen thatch, whom he shared with Tom Fred the donkeyman and many another seaman, clearly and near to him, speaks from bedroom of her dust. In that gulf and haven, fleets by the dozen have anchored for the little heaven of the night. But she speaks to Captain Napping Cat alone. Mrs. Crow. From Duck Lane, Jack, quack twice and ask for Rosie. Is the one love of his life that was sardine with women. What sea did you see, Tom Cat, Tom Cat? In your sailoring days long, long ago, what seabees were in the wavery green when you were my master? 
I'll tell you the truth. Seas barking like seals, blue seas and green seas covered with eels and mer-